This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The Intercept is reporting The New York Times has instructed its reporters to avoid using the terms genocide, ethnic cleansing, and occupied territory in its coverage of Israel's war on Gaza. The Intercept's report is based on an internal memo from The Times. One newsroom source told The Intercept, quote, I think it's the kind of thing that looks professional and logical if you have no knowledge of the historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But if you do know, it'll be clear how ap apologetic it is to Israel, they said. Today, we're joined by a Palestinian journalist who's been highly critical of how the Western media has portrayed Israel's war in Gaza. Dalia Hatuka is an independent Palestinian journalist specializing in Israeli-Palestinian affairs, usually based between Amman, Jordan, and Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. She was a close friend and colleague of the Al Jazeera reporter Shireen Abu Akla, who was shot dead by an Israeli sniper in the occupied West Bank May 11, 20. 22. Dahlia's latest piece for the Century Foundation is headlined, Under Cover of Gaza War, Assault on West Bank Accelerates. Dahlia joins us now in our New York studio after speaking last night at the Columbia Journalism School. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Um, this was also the topic of your panel at uh, the Columbia J School last night, uh, the issue of how the conflict is being covered. What do you think is most important for people to understand, Dahlia? Well, um, I think that a lot of what's missing from uh, the bigger uh, portrait or the puzzle, so to speak, is uh, the, the, the Palestinian voice. So um, in order to find out what's going on in Gaza, we need to not just rely on Western uh, journalists coming into Gaza. I know that's very important, and it's a demand by uh, a lot of us um, and by, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists and other uh, journalism rights groups. Uh, but it's also to amplify Palestinian voices, because ultimately nobody knows Gaza better than the Gazan journalists on the ground who are actually doing the work that they're doing right now. And in a way, these journalists, uh, not only are they fighting for their lives while doing all of this, uh, they're also um, resorting to extraordinary measures to be able to cover what's going on. And, and speaking to journalists on the ground, they, they tell us that what we're seeing from them is only like 10 percent of what's happening in Gaza at the moment. And, uh, Dalia, I want to <clears throat> ask you, <clears throat> the, uh, the Western press does have the opportunity to cover what is going on uh, in the West Bank. And yet this, uh, as you wrote in a recent piece, uh, more than 4,000 West Bank Palestinians have been displaced uh, uh, just in 2023, the highest number ever recorded. What is going on in, uh, in the West Bank from what you've been able to see? Basically, in the West Bank, um, the fog of war has um, allowed Israel to per perpetuate um, crimes a a at a very uh, large scale, not only throughout the West Bank, but including occupied East Jerusalem. And in the West Bank, we've got what um, a lot of uh, even Israeli officials have admitted are pogroms that are going on by and being perpetrated by Israeli settlers, uh, especially in uh, villages around Nablus, for example, which are um, in the north, where um, uh, there are many settlements surrounding uh, villages. Uh, we're not talking about just, you know, the torching of. Uh, um, houses and the torching of cars and whatnot. We're talking about people getting killed by armed settlers. And while uh, they're being armed and attacking Palestinians, they're also uh, being helped or aided by Israeli soldiers, whose job technically is to be there to not allow such things to happen. But uh, in a way, you know, sometimes they just sit by idly and not do anything, or they actually um, participate in these attacks. That's why when you look at the UN figures, a lot of the times we see, you know, 10 Palestinians have been killed by settlers, two Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces. But then there is a line that says, 
three Palestinians have been killed by Israeli settlers and or um, uh, soldiers. So we don't know because they are part of the system that's subjugating these Palestinians that's, you know, um, carrying out all this violence against them. And it's not just those who are killed, but also the detentions of Palestinians in the West Bank. Could you talk about the conditions that they're facing in Israeli custody? The, the detentions, honestly, uh, they're atrocious, and they are the, the least talked about, um, even among um, uh, uh, Western journalists who actually haven't been really mentioning this at all. Uh, we're talking about the, 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 the least amount of, of, you know, livable s situations uh, that can be, that any, any detainee can live in. So they get water up to two hours a day now. Um, uh, sometimes they don't get to shower. The food that they get is rotten. I'm talking about the, the de uh, detainees in um, the 9,000 or so in uh, Israeli prisons. Uh, they don't have access to uh, their families. They don't have access to lawyers. Um, uh, the, the people who have come out have come out with um, um, some have had their limbs amputated because of the extended use of um, uh, handcuffs. So honestly, the conditions are really harrowing and, and uh, there's not much access. And right now, as we speak, I was just seeing that there is uh, a detainee who was who died in in uh, actually in an Israeli hospital uh, a few days ago, and his body is still being withheld, and his family has not been able to um, put him to rest because uh, even though he had already carried out his sentence uh, thirty or more years, which which is quite frankly. Um, uh, a devastating thing for the family because they're unable to get any kind of closure. You're talking, of course, about Walid Dhaka. Um, his uh, human rights groups, everyone had asked for him to uh, be released, as he was there for almost 40 years and he was dying of cancer. I, speaking of people who have died not in prison but outside, the last time I spoke to you uh, was just after Shireen Abu Akhla was killed, May 11, 2022, as she was a dear friend of yours, the uh, Al Jazeera Arabic reporter outside the Janine refugee camp all laid out now, determined to be an Israeli sniper who killed her as her colleagues tried to reach her. They shot at them, clearly wearing press. It wasn't in the middle of any kind of skirmish. Um, they were just standing outside. Um, this issue of journalists being killed that you spoke of before, uh, the memorial for Shireen outside Janine has now been bulldozed over, destroyed by the Israeli military. But even in Gaza, and you took this up last night, um, you and your colleagues on the panel, of what's happening to journalists. Even you were surprised, you said, as we spoke before the show, by learning about when David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, asked, how do you know that journalists are targeted? Talk about the response. Uh, basically, we were very lucky to have uh, um, a journalist from Gaza who managed to leave uh, the coastal enclave, um, the besieged coastal enclave, uh, to Qatar. Her name is Amira Haruda. And uh, she had to leave, obviously, because, you know, for her well-being and her family, she has four kids. Anyways, she was talking about the fact that uh, journalists would get phone calls from Israeli uh, authorities, military authorities, um, uh, basically uh, questioning them about their work, um, especially if they worked for Qatar, which is a, a little strange, considering that Qatar is the go-between, uh, uh, you know, between Israel and uh, Hamas for the talks to uh, reach a ceasefire and to release the hostages. So, and, and uh, in the meantime, also CPJ, w you know, was talking to uh, a few journalists who were uh, released after being detained, and they had been um, taken away for 33 days, um, made to sit in squatting positions in horrific conditions. Um, they came out, you know, having lost 30 kilos or so. Um, there, there's a lot going on in, in that sense, but also the targeting of journalists. People know because there are UAVs or drones, as we say, 
uh, constantly hovering in Gaza. It's, it's, it's so perpetual that people um, in Gaza, if they don't hear a UAV, they think something's wrong. Uh, UAVs have been part of, of the Gaza skyline for years, long before October 7th. And even the phone calls from the Israeli military to journalists threatening them? Yes, absolutely. And in the West Bank, they do the same thing. They call them in, they say, we want to have a chat with you, and then they don't come out because, you know, they, they take them in, they, they can put them in admi administrative detention, which, as you know, is basically when you put uh, people in or Palestinians in prison without any kind of uh, um, without any kind of proof or without charging them, uh, and it's very easy to do that. I mean, right now there's a, um, a, a, a young Christian girl who's a student. She's in administrative detention for four months, and I know that the Archbishop of Canterbury was calling for her release. So it, it, all these things are intertwined. There's there's a lot of things going on that don't, that are far reaching. It's not just about journalists. And the journalists who are being detained in Gaza are being questioned about their reporting? Absolutely. Interrogated for hours? Absolutely. Because what, what the, the questions that they were being asked is, why did you write this? Why did you say this? Do you talk to Hamas people? Of course they talk to Hamas people. It's their job. It's like how you talk to Israeli forces. You're going to, uh, how you talk to Israeli um, military personnel or government officials. I mean, that's your job as a journalist. Your job is to talk to people. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Dalia Hatuka, you, you're usually based in Amman, Jordan, or, or in Ramallah in the West Bank, but you're here in the United States now. What's your, what's your message to the American public and to the Biden administration, given that this country is the largest supplier of, of weapons and military aid to Israel? I think honestly, the the American public has has um, has been very instrumental in in um, in working with Palestinians. A large large segments of the Palestine of the American public have been working with Palestinians. I've seen a lot of support. I've seen a lot of support among Israeli uh, Israelis. Uh, you know, the the few Israelis who get it. Uh, I've seen a lot of support among um, American Jews, and I, I believe that they are uh, one of the Palestinians' biggest allies. Um, uh, but my message, obviously, to Biden is, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot at stake right now. Um, the Biden administration can do so much, and, and that's been proven over by the fact that, you know, once Biden put his foot down, uh, several steps were taken by Israel in, op in order to open the border crossings or some of the border crossings into Gaza. Um, but I believe that um, taking this this kind of um, blind support for Netanyahu is is leading us nowhere. And as an American as well, not only as a Palestinian, I have bigger fears of what's to come come November, because if Biden loses the election, and he might because of the situation, because of what's going on in, in Gaza, then we are doomed, basically, to have another four years of a Trump administration. So in my mind, I'm like, you know, we, we, we are doomed in the Middle East. We're doomed in, in, um, in, in the U.S. And uh, I know that's a lot of doom and gloom. But honestly, these are some of the thoughts that people, especially dual nationals like me, these are some of the thoughts that they have. Dalia Hatuko, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Palestinian independent journalist, usually based between Amman, Jordan, and occupied uh, Ramallah. That's Ramallah in the occupied West Bank.